this is Welcome back, Beans Army, to another episode of the Less Is More Sports Podcast, the college offseason podcast, where you could say we're less of the regular season, but more of the offseason. It's just me and Matt today. Ryan is at his junior prom, and we hope he has a great time. Prom is fun. I enjoyed prom so much that I went seven times. But with it being just me and Matt today, I'm trying to convince Matt that we still have a lot to talk about to where we do not have enough time to talk about UFOs and cryptids. But I don't know if it's working. Let's feed unsolved, man. I'm telling you, that that's the spinoff series gold right there. Let's feed unsolved. I mean, I, given the nature of the show, I don't think their fans would g- appreciate it if I just went on like a Godzilla or a Broly rant. Or they might. You I don't, don't know. know. You don't know. I mean, I feel like that would just completely flip the narrative of the show. How many people out there have avatars of like uh, Goku in their like Twitter pics when they're arguing, though? Come on. I mean, I don't see that as much in the sports feeds, to be completely honest. Really? I would I see that past time. anybody, but I, I just that's just not what pops up on my message boards. I see that all the time on Twitter. It's like two dudes with Goku profile pictures, and occasionally you'll get a Piccolo or a Vegeta. But, you know, it's mostly Goku. I, I, yeah, you and I have very different Twitter followers or followees or whatever the correct terminology is there. We travel in different circles. This podcast... This podcast is just synergy. I, I like to live by the Drake motto where he says, I got a small circle. I'm out with different crews. Mm, that's a good motto. That's yeah, that's a good, a good motto. motto to have. Don't get involved in any feuds because uh, if you go by the Drake model, you're going to get destroyed. So No, 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 no. Drake actually won that beef, in my opinion. Okay, that's a discussion for another show. Though. That is, Yeah, that's not what we're here to do. And feel free to debate that in the comment section below, but that is not what we're here to do today. We have a lot of topics that we do have to get to that are part of the show, and we're going to start with our very own mid-major Matt segment because we have some lower-level conference realignments. So, mid-major Matt, get into the mid-major expertise. Yeah, this is one of those interesting fields where it shows like the difference in what's coming with uh, college basketball and college football because I know this is very... This doesn't seem important, but it illustrates where the sports are headed. And that's earlier this week, Missouri State announced that they were moving to Conference USA. And to me, that's strictly a football move. And I mean, it shows that football is the moneymaker. You want to have a good, strong football conference. And that's why they're going. So they're leaving the predominantly basketball Missouri Valley. We all know Missouri Valley's done. I mean, they gave us Indiana State and Drake last year. They've given us good teams in the past, a couple good Bradley squads. They're leaving that conference primarily because of football and joining Conference USA, which includes teams like Western Kentucky, which includes teams like UTEP, Middle Tennessee State. But the craziest thing about this, like, Missouri State move, it's like it's not the only time Conference USA has expanded this summer alone. They added the University of Delaware earlier this year. So now we have a conference that goes from Dover, Delaware, Bowling Green, Kentucky, to Murfreesboro, Murfreesboro, Tennessee, to Springfield, Missouri, to Las Cruces, New Mexico, because New Mexico State's part of this conference too. And it just goes to show that like, if you've got a football program and you know that's where the money's at, the distance between schools is a non-factor. You want the TV deal. You want the money. You want that because you know, even if it doesn't make sense for the standpoint of the other sports, like I'm sure that like fans of Missouri State are looking forward to their longstanding rivalry with the Aggies of New Mexico State. But if you got the football money, you can keep all those programs afloat, keep yourself happy, keep everyone paid, and just keep moving on. More intriguing to me, though, was Grand Canyon University, who, you know, we have we could have a whole other show about, like, the opinions on that university. At the University of Seattle, or Seattle University, joining the WAC, of course, the Conference of Gonzaga and St. Mary's, a very basketball-oriented, basketball-only conference. And it shows, like, the, to me, it demonstrates really well the difference in the two mindsets of sports. If you've got football, you want that football money. The big conference realignments are coming. You're looking at two divisions soon. You just got to get your hands on that football money. Basketball is a little bit different. You're building more of a competitive conference, so that way you're still watchable if when the football stuff takes over. 
Because now, not only are we going to, if Grand Canyon continues to mobilize the resources they have, now you've got Grand Canyon, Gonzaga, St. Mary's, San Francisco, whenever they have a good year, Pepperdine, schools who have a little bit of a pedigree now, especially Grand Canyon with that fan base and that huge arena. You're just adding more, you're just adding more fires to coals of the fire, and you've got a really good basketball conference, but. It act it too makes sense because you know the Grand Canyon, Arizona, Seattle, Washington, and you know it's intriguing to me just to see like the difference between building your conference from a football standpoint where you just want the money, and the basketball standpoint where you're competing to stay relevant. So that was one interesting story to me from the mid major standpoint, and now we get to see the trickle down effects because, like I said, Who's going to join the Missouri Valley now? Early things, early indicators point to a Murray State, a Moorhead State. Then who, who's going to join the Ohio Valley Conference? Then who's going to replace whoever, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And now you're looking at teams who, you know, like are Division Two, II, Division Three. Somebody's going to have to move up to replace these guys. And out west, in the case of the Grand Canyon, we've lost an entire conference. The SWAT, it, it's gone. So... It's going to be, this is just one of those moves where it seems minor now, but it's interesting because now somebody has to move up to fill those spots, and it's going to be interesting to see who that is. So, yeah, interesting weekend from the conference realignment standpoint. I hate to see some of these mid major, I hate to see the mid major conferences get broken apart because of football, but I also love to see them increase in stature with the basketball. So, it's, a, it's the best of, it was the best of times, it's the worst of times. For the sake of not getting into what I think about when I hear the term WAC conference, uh, we're going to get into another mid-major Matt territory move, which is Doug Gottlieb, you know, college basketball analyst, has his own radio show, is becoming the new head basketball coach of Green Bay, not to be confused with the Packers here. Matt, what are your thoughts on that move? The Green Bay Phoenix, baby, of the Horizon League, I do believe. Let me double check that. I think I, I am correct. I don't know why I doubted myself. I know these teams inside out and backwards. I'm kidding. I actually don't. But, yeah, I mean, what happened here was Sundance Wicks, who was the head coach of the Green Bay Phoenix last season, had a okay year. I mean, they were 18 and 14. They weren't expected to do much at all. Had a really good conference record. And like I said, they weren't expected to do much. Gets a call from his alma mater. Gets a call from a place he's very close to in uh, – he was head – he was – that Wicks was the co coach of the year in the horizon. He gets a call from a team that he where he was an assistant for three years in Wyoming. We all know Wyoming is in the Mountain West Conference, it's a step up. So naturally, he takes the gig, and it's very late in the cycle. And you know, I know everyone was mostly clowning on Doug Gottlieb, who's kind of like he's an easy target. He had his troubles in college, he's kind of an I don't know if annoying is the right word, he has a reputation of being annoying. People kind of like to dunk on him. And they're like, what are you doing, Green Bay? And I'm like, and at first I was like that too. It's like, what the hell? You guys went 18 and 4. And then you think about it a little bit more and it's like, look, you're incredibly late in the coaching cycle right now if you're Green Bay. All your dudes are going to enter the transfer portal or at least entertain the transfer portal. You weren't expected. You were expected to take a step up, but you weren't really favored just yet in your conference. You weren't a powerhouse. So you're already behind the eight ball compared to other schools. You've got everybody in the portal this late. You don't have a coach. So, you know, why not do something that attracts the media? It's not like a Deion Sanders type thing where you got like a superstar to come back and do it. But it is somebody who people have heard of. Somebody who is going to get Green Bay mentioned on the Jeff Goodman shows or on Fox Sports 1, or on CBS Sports, because he knows the right people. And, you know, if he wins, it's just a bonus point. And like I said, going back to that point where people kind of think he's a little bit annoying, I'm sure there are some people on coaching staffs at places like St. John's and uh, UConn and in the Big Ten who are like, if they don't have their schedule filled out yet, who wouldn't mind, you know, hmm, that dude insulted me 20 years ago. He said it was a mediocre coach. I might as well go stick it to him while he's at Green Bay. So, you know, I think it's kind of a smart move. Doesn't work out after a year. Everybody moves on. We forget all about this happening. And it's one season in a year where, as we're going to discuss, in a time period where, as we're going to discuss, you can rebuild a roster fairly quickly if you get a guy with enough gumption. So, you know, why not put your name in the media circus? Why not get covered on Jeff Goodman, Colin Cowherd, 
people who know Doug Gottlieb are going to talk about him if he's doing well. If, if they ever pull an upset, you know that's going to be on somebody's show. So, I mean, when you're that far behind in the coaching cycle, and now with the transfer portal, all your guys can go anywhere without penalty because you've, the coach left. You might as well just take a shot in the dark and try for a little bit of relevance, maybe a little bit of fun. If it works out, great. If it doesn't, cut your losses at the end of the season and move on. You got the transfer portal now. You can rebuild a roster really quick if you want. So, yeah, that was my. Those were my initial thoughts. It's like, at first, it hits you as like, oh my god, what are we doing? And then the more you think about it, it's like, yeah, you know what? There are definitely worse things you could do. You could just do nothing at all. And I mean, to get covered in the media, you know, that, that's a big leg up in today's mar- market where some people may cut like 12 second TikTok videos of like things that are said about somebody. So, yeah, you know, it's a move that doesn't really sound great, but actually makes a lot of sense when you think about it. I think it's interesting that he's going to coach while still doing his radio show. I feel like there could be co- some kind of conflict of interest there. And the same narrative is floating around with the J.J. Redick being the potentially uh, next head coach of the Lakers move and his ties to being on the on ESPN and his Old Man in the Three podcast and the Mind of the Game podcast with LeBron. I don't know. This is just slippery territory that goes either really good or really bad. And we'll see if he lasts the five years like his contract states. So that's where I stand on it. I'd be surprised. I can't lie. Yeah, yeah I'd be I'd be shocked. I'd be more shocked than. Well, I can't think of anything more shocking, to be completely honest, at the at the moment. I don't know. My mind just kind of drew a blank there. I don't know. I have an empty space in my mind right now. What do you think, Bean? You think he'll last five years? No. No. He said no. He shook his head no. But anyways, That's I tough. think it's time to move on to the next topic, which is great Ozabor signs with Washington, one of the top players in the portal, and he is signing – for a $2 million deal, which will make him the highest paid player in college basketball. So my question to you, Matt, is does he deserve it? Criticizing this move on this podcast seems like it would be the most hypocritical thing ever. Right. As much as we've talked about players deserve to get their bag, players this, players that, I'm not going to say if he's worth it or not, Les, because he's getting his bag. I, I've advocated for that for four years. If I said, let, oh, okay, my God. Okay, let me rephrase the question. Does he deserve to be the highest paid player in college basketball? Do, not does he deserve a bag. They We all agree they deserve the bag. Does he deserve to be paid more than any other player in college basketball right now? I mean, why not? That's all I have to say about it. Why not? I mean, you know, the interesting thing is we enter into this period, Les, is we'll t- take a look at Washington. They're transferring to the Big Ten. They have a new head coach. Their expectations are low this year. Now that you've got NIL, you know, why not go out, spend $2 million to get a kid to come in, give him his bag, and, you know, treat him like we did Damian Lillard in the NBA all those years, you know, like doing it, not running from the grind, you know? If you're going to, if you're not sure of the product you're going to have on the court this year, you might as well give the fans somebody to get behind, kind of like a guy on a small market team in the NBA. You know, great Osobor, you know, we all know what happened when they played Purdue last year. They were a very good team in the Mountain West. They did not win their conference tournament, but they were won their regular season. And then they ran into Purdue, and we know how good Purdue was until they hit UConn. So they might as well. I mean, like I said, if your expectations are low, you might as well give the fans someone to rally behind. Give them a folk hero. Like, And if just because he's making $2 million, that makes him all the more special because, you know, you've got the NIL money lying around and you want to reward a guy for going into a potentially tough situation, do it. Just do it. You know, give the fans someone who they can appreciate, who they can love. And, you know, like I said, if it doesn't work out after a year, you're good. But just for one season, give the fans and the player what they want. Give them a little spectacle. Roll from there. And I'll admit, I hadn't watched a lot of Ozabor over the years, but I was been watching tape to prepare for this episode. And I definitely see that he, he's a good player, for sure. His name alone is great for NIL deals. And his game reminds me a lot of Oscar Shibwe, who won Player of the Year back in 2022. But do I think he will be the highest paid player by season's end? Because, you know, in the college game, this can fluctuate, all depending on yeah. popularity and, and whatnot and name, image, and likeness value. Do I think he'll be the highest paid player by season's end? No. I think, and this might be sound like a biased take, I really don't care, that once Cooper Flagg 
makes his appearance on a nationally televised game for a program that has some of the highest rated games every year with all of his notoriety from his high school ga- high school days, dare I say his NIL value will raise the flag. You know, I had to throw that in somehow. Raise, oh God, my little ward. I know you had to, but still, I didn't expect it to be raise the flag. Raise the flag, a, pledge allegiance to the flag. I mean, oh God, that's even worse. Now you're committing treason. <laughs> We will never do that on this podcast. It's treason, then. No. Sorry. Uh, Revenge of the Sith references. They, they come naturally. I'm sorry. That's fair. That's fair. I mean, I, I, we, threw in, we threw in a bunch of random non-sports references to begin the show. I think it's only Are right you that you throw me, in a Star Wars reference. Are you threatening me, Master Jedi? <laughs> Matt, I think, he uses the same voice oh. for that as he, did for the, as he does for the Emperor Bean voice. Yes, that, that's why. It's because I based it on the Emperor from Star Wars. Right. Do How do you feel about that, Bean? I am the Emperor. Execute Order 66. I thought you were about to say 69. I ain't gonna lie. No. No, no, no. That's not part of the lore. Come on, Les. I know I, I'm not lore. Okay, I'm not up to date on Star Wars lore. I, I never... Star Wars is one thing that I never did nerd out about. Okay, we'll have to discuss that later, but right now... uh Right now, what's our next topic before I before I start crying about this? Uh, we're going local. Pat Kelsey and Louisville basketball add more players with Kashawn Pryor, Connie Roots, and Noah Waterman. And dare I say, Matt, that Louisville's roster might be able to compete with Kentucky's new roster. What are your thoughts on the moves that Pat Kelsey is making? I mean, we've been high on Pat Kelsey, it seems like, for a while now. I mean, this just proves it's rightfully so. And I love the people who are commenting on everything like, oh, my God, mid-major all-star team, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I, I know that there's no such thing as a moral victory in sports or whatever, or whatever they want to say. But let's think about this. This program was in absolutely the worst place you could be for a team who wants to be one of the top 12 programs in the country. You just had your worst head coach historically of all time. In the past two years, you'd lost to Lipscomb. You've lost to Chattanooga. You've lost to Arkansas State. Don't forget about you a D2 lost, team twice. You, I was about to say, don't forget about Lenore Ryan. You lost at DePaul. DePaul. You had academic, you had health issues with three players. You had the whole Karan Davis situation. You had the Titanic quote. You had, I mean, it was abysmal. Just absolutely abysmal. And not to mention, you didn't even have a team three months ago. 13 players transfer out from this roster. You end up with your third choice. And Louisville fans, don't lie to me about that. You know you didn't want Pat Kelsey. You wanted Scott Drew. And then you wanted to bring Rick Patino back. And then you wanted Richard Patino. And then you got Pat Kelsey. Let's be honest about that. Sometimes blessings aren't the way, aren't what you think. And he's gone out and basically added 12 completely different players, flipped this roster over to the point where now, like Les said, they're competitive. They've got guys who can play defense. They've got now with the Noah Waterman thing, they've got length. The guy averaged 9.5 points per game. He's a shooter. Kaysan Pryor was excellent at South Florida last year, a big reason why. And people forget this. They beat UAF, FAU, I mean, and Memphis to clinch that regular season championship. South Florida ain't no slouch, so now they've got height, they've got shooting, they've got guys who can defend. They have a good mix of guys who can be offensively minded and defensive minded, depending on the situation. If you're Louisville, you know, I know you expect to land everybody huge in a portal. You think you're getting Kadari Richmond and Omar Ballo, and you're going to have like the freaking and 19- great Ozabor. And great Ozabor. You think you're getting the dream team out there, but. This is pretty. This is a hell of a roster. I don't know if they're going to use that thirteenth spot on anybody, but I mean already. And I know two guys are redshirting, so you do have some space to move around, guys. But as far as I consider this Louisville re- rebuild, the Reviveville, as they're calling it, because everyone loves a good pun. I kind of dig it too. Is a complete success to me. I mean, you got the you got your crown jewel and Chucky Hepburn. You got the mid-major all-stars, several conference player of the years. 
I think Louisville's in good shape. I'm not going to go out there and say, oh, my God, Louisville's going to the Sweet 16 because you're importing 13 new players, you know, with a new coach. It's going to take a while to adjust. I still say 20 wins. I still say 20 wins. I can see 20 very easily. But I'm not going to go act like, oh, my God, they're a Sweet 16 team right now. And the best part about this is we're going to get to see them fairly early on because they're in a very good battle for Atlantis field this year with Providence, IU, Arizona, West Virginia. A lot of intriguing teams who have been put together over the offseason who are still fairly getting used to each other are going to be going at it, and that's going to be a lot of fun to watch. But if you're a Louisville fan, I don't see how you're not excited about this revival because it really is. Because, I mean, like I said, you go from losing to Lenore Ryan, 13 guys leaving the team, to almost having a full roster and a lot of excitement and different – and more importantly – Different types of guys that you can throw out there who are all incredibly athletic. And I want to point out that a couple of Pat Kelsey's commits came from BYU, where the current Kentucky coach just came from. And I think that only makes it better for the rivalry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I got to state this because, you know, it's not a less is more sports podcast without shouting out Boise State. Kashawn Pryor, the one that Boise State let get away. I got to say that. But as we're also talking about additions, you know, Kentucky and Duke both add play, added players this week. Kentucky added Ansley Aminor from – is that my pronouncing that right? Yeah, it's close enough. I Ansley Am- Al- 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 Yeah, Al- 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 yeah. Al- yeah. I just want to make sure I get his name right. I don't want to make anybody mad here. From FDU. And, of course, Duke added Cameron Sheffield from Rice, which last time we added a Rice transfer, we won a national championship. You know, I had to throw that fact out there. Do you even know who I'm talking about? No, I don't. I was getting ready to ask you. Sean Obi. Oh, wow. That's, that's a name I haven't heard in a long time. Yeah, Sean Obi, let's be honest, was a practice player to let get Jaleel Okafor used to the physicality of the college game. Yeah. That's because he but really didn't see that. He didn't see the court a lot at Duke. Let's be but honest. But he got, he got his Duke he degree. Made though. Practice, you know. Mm. Yeah. He, yeah. He, uh, he got his Duke degree, though, which is worth noting. That is worth and, noting. Once a part of the brotherhood, always a part of the brotherhood. And Just ask Warren Goldwire. <laughs> and, of course, Indiana adds Langdon Hatton from Bellarmine, guy they really needed. Backup big, 6'10", with some shooting ability. Really like the addition. And now, much like Louisville, I think Indiana is done. So now we just wait. We wait for the fall. I also found a new storyline that's as right before we got on the pod today that Arkansas is going after two international studs right now. One that I've seen play in Nolan Treor, I saw him play in the Nike Hoop Summit. Let me tell you, Matt, baller. They land him, that guard lineage that Calipari has in connections to the NBA. You see with Shade mm-hmm. Gilgis, Alexander, and company, it's only going to add to it if he lands Treor. That dude is a baller. I mean, he was literally Team World's best bucket getter, him and A.J. Dibanso. And then there's mm-hmm. another one, Igor Devin, who is a Russian prospect. I ha- I'm going to be honest, I haven't seen him, and I'm not going to talk about him because I haven't seen him. But apparently he is an elite prospect. And I've heard the terms thrown around that, you know, you got Cooper Flagg and Ace Bailey as the top NBA draft prospects for 2025. And apparently Igor Devin is right there with him. So if they can land him, that's big time. Early on, Indiana was interested in Igor Devin. And I was it was kind of impressive to see, like, how nobody, even in the year of our Lord 2024, could really find any consistent highlights of the guy. (laughs) Right. I mean, uh, international prospects are hard to get footage of. I remember like even when Luka Doncic was coming out in the NBA draft and I was trying to find as much tape as I could on him. And it was that you couldn't find a lot. And that's why I never really had a legit opinion about Luka Doncic until he played preseason, because that's where I actually saw him. And I was like, I don't know how I feel about him. And I know there's somebody out there that'll watch the pod that will give me shit because I didn't. I said, I don't know how I feel about Luka Doncic. Well, I hadn't seen a lot of them. I don't know. I can't tell you if I don't see a lot of you. But then once he played his first preseason game, I was like, yeah, this dude's the truth. This dude's a baller. He's legit. So it'll be interesting to see if Arkansas could mine the transfer portal of the world. That's exactly. The world portal. (laughs) Hey, we were on the same page on that. I like it. We were on the same page. I like that. For the first time in the Less is More Sports history, me and Matt were on the same page of a pun. We are like, we're like brothers, only closer. (laughs) <laughs> I lift my shirt up and we're connected just like Spongebob and Squidward. Exactly. <laughs> that would be pretty painful given that we're like I 30 miles I apart. Like, I don't know. Time. What do we like better, Calipari University or Worldport? 
I don't know. They're both pretty good. We need to make a poll of that. Which is our best pun? Yes, we'll run the poll after the show. What is the better nickname for Arkansas's tenure right now? Uh, Uni- Calipari University or or World Court? I like it. We're This is going to be interesting. This is going to be very interesting. But for time constraints, I think we need to get to the most important topic of the show. One that had both you, me, and Ryan. Did I say both? That is completely bad math right there. Anyways. The one that had all three of us the most excited about and the one that Ryan is the most disappointed and missing. But no need to fear. We do have his statements ready to go. But with the week one of the college football game schedule officially out, Matt and I and Ryan have named our three top games that we are looking forward to and why. And Matt, I will start with you. What is the first game you want to talk about? Yeah, might as well start with one of the earlier highlighted games on the week one schedule, which is North Dakota State at Colorado. We know what the Bison do year in and year out at the FBS level, but we also love Travis Hunter and Deion Sanders and Shadur Sanders. And, man, that's just going to be a really fun game because the upset potential is there. And if Colorado loses the to an FBS school, even arguably the most successful FBS school that ever was, were, or will be, we already know what the narratives are going to look like after that game, and we're going to have some fun picking them apart and discussing them the next week if we do that. So that's my first – that's the game I'm really looking forward to. It's a great way to kick off the college football season. North Dakota State, like I said, we know what the Bison are capable of. This seems to be a make-or-break year for Colorado, especially with Dion's recent activity on Twitter. That's just got fun game and potential upset written all over it, and I'm here for it. The first game I want to talk about is Notre Dame versus Texas A&M, and anyone who watched this podcast knows exactly why I picked this game. Riley Leonard versus his former coach, both at their new places. It begins what I've said is the beginning of the Leonard for Heisman campaign, and it also begins the Mike era, Mike Elko era, almost got ahead of myself there, that I think will bring a championship to the 12th man. And now so, for Ryan's yes. first game. No, no, no. I'm, has... I, I'll just, I'm just going to read Ryan's off at the end. Okay, good. I want to make, yeah, I want to make sure that we get, um, because I want to word it exactly how he words it, because he asked me. Okay, that. sounds good. Sounds good. So my second game is probably the game people are thinking the least about, which is Western Kentucky at Alabama. I really just picked this because I want to see what the Kellen DeBoer era is going to look like. I mean, we know I've been a fan of his since he's been at IU. Jalen Milrose back. But I also love Western Kentucky, and they're usually a sneaky good team. Still think Alabama will win, but I'm very curious to see how they come out in their first game under Kellen DeBoer. And it's gonna it's just going to be a fun one, I feel like. I mean, even if they win by 30 points, I feel like it's like a 50-24 like to 24 type ball game or something. Just a lot of fun. So Western Kentucky at Alabama – kicking off the Kellen DeBoer era in prime time in Tuscaloosa. And as for my second game, I'm going to talk about LSU versus USC. It's two explosive offenses on paper, two well-known head coaches, and two teams replacing their star quarterbacks. Even though there is a lot of mystery involved with these teams, we are still having a great idea of what to expect from these two programs. So my number two, again, is LSU versus USC. And we just hit the 10 minute mark. Look at that. Look at this. We're gonna make we're gonna make great time here. This um, does not mean gonna... we have enough time to talk about cryptids. Damn it. You're no fun. Well, my third game is Penn State at West Virginia. West Virginia was one of those teams you and I talked about on the hot seat last year for especially for Neil Brown. Came out, surpassed expectations, had a really decent season. Very impressive. It's gonna be interesting to see how they how they uh do against Penn State, but I'm more interested in Penn State here because I know you and Ryan have talked about this, but Drew Aller had one of the all-time forgettable spring game performances of all time. And after how last year's games at Ohio State and Michigan went, the guy needs a confidence booster. Let's be honest here. I mean, after a horrible spring game and basically being taken out of the game by his coach, he needs a good one here to start against West Virginia. You know, I know West Virginia isn't georgia or clemson or anything like that for penn state but they're still in the big 12 and still play really competitively so they're they've got momentum after last season drew aller needs to have a huge confidence boost this is just going to be fun to watch because i think it could set the tone for both team seasons depending on who wins and loses and if penn state loses it could be like the 
beginning of the end feel for James Franklin. So that's my third game, Penn State and West Virginia. And for my third game, I have Miami versus Florida. Look, we've been asking this question for I don't even know how long, but is the U finally back? And if you've been following the trend of Mario Cristobal's previous tenure at Oregon, this is year three where he does expect to turn it around. And also, there's a lot of buzz going around with Florida, too. They just landed Cormani McLean. There's a lot of hype with their fan base that they think they can have a very good team as well. So this rivalry game should be a hell of a matchup. And not to mention Graham Mertz last year. He was good, but you could argue was not great. So if he comes out and struggles, we could also see the a first appearance of one of the top quarterbacks in this class in DJ Lagway. Now, I personally think he's overrated. That's my opinion. But I've been wrong before. And regardless whether he is overrated, underrated, or properly rated, what's not exciting about the potential of the debut of one of the top co- uh, top college quarterback prospects? And, and you know, now, that, now we get to Ryan's list. Or what were you going to say? Before that, I'd like to say that that game will definitely come down to the final kneel and if Miami takes it. I feel like there was a a, a tried pun there that I just completely missed because I'm having – You don't remember when they game. failed against Georgia Tech last year? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I'm a little spacey today. Oh, you're fine. You're fine. I just want to get that in there. It comes down to the kneel down that game. But, yes, now it's time for Ryan's big three. So, let's take it away. All right, so his first one is Georgia versus Clemson. And keep in mind that I am reading his words, not mine. I think Georgia is going to steamroll Clemson in Mercedes-Benz Stadium, which is in Georgia's backyard. Short, sweet, to the point. I respect it, Ryan. His number two game is Florida State at Georgia Tech. Florida State will have a new-looking team, and how will they be bringing DJ Uyangale in to incorporate their offense? So, solid. Good question. Good question. And I'm very intrigued with this number three one, Fresno State at Michigan. He says, I'm very curious to see what Michigan's offense looks like. Their defense will still be one of the best. Ryan, well said, and we hope you're enjoying your prom festivities at the moment. Yes, have a great time, buddy. But, Les, you know, there is something I do want to comment on from earlier. You know, it's been a really busy week on uh, social media, especially in our area. With like what's been going on, especially for sports, with what's been going on at the U at the PGA Open at Valhalla, with the Harrison Butker comments. But you know, there was one tweet that I saw this week on social media that's really had my head buzzing since I saw it, Les. And uh, I think you'll know it if I can find it because I think you said it, and it's been buzzing in my head ever since. It was about Cooper Flag, of course, because that's what Les tweets about. We know that. And I know that you were going for the word nightmare was in there, right? Oh, the I think I know, I know I know exactly what you're talking about. You were talking about how defending Duke next year with all those tall guys was going to be a nightmare and how Cooper Flagg was Freddy Krueger. Yep. But, man, something about that stood out to me. Freddy Krueger, he doesn't have a team. He doesn't play with a squad, you know? So it's like, if you want to be scary, but also have somebody who plays in the team, you know, you, I did spend time deliberating on this. You you should have said, you know, Cooper Flagg is the pinhead of the Cenobites of Duke University from, like, the Hellraiser franchise. Or, like, Cooper Flagg is the Dracula of this monster squad for the Duke. Because, you know, they're playing as a team, you know, Freddy Krueger... He manipulates Jason and Freddy versus Jason, but he's not really a team player, you know? He's doing it for himself. Freddy wants himself to be remembered. That's why he's doing all this. And I feel like Cooper Flagg is a little bit less arrogant than Freddy Krueger. So I, I was thinking, like, you know, a Cena by a team leader. He's like the Godzilla of the monster team up, you know? Godzilla's no. mostly like a one man army himself, though, in majority of the movies. I mean, obviously, with the new Kong, uh, ex Godzilla movie, New Empire, they team up and stuff. But yeah, yeah for the mo- for like ninety percent of Godzilla movies, he's by himself. So by he that does team up occasionally. He works occasionally, with occasionally. Yes, he works, he works with Mothra and Rodan. Rodan, depending Rodan. on how he's depicted in that series. In the good old days, he would team up with Jet Jaguar every once in a while. You know, he, he's got allies, but it's like. I get what you're going for with the nightmare pun, but Freddy Krueger, you know, he has a tendency to be kind of a jerk. I don't think Freddy, I, I don't think Freddy Flag. That would be a great name. Freddy Flag. 
Freddie Cooper Flag. Flag. I don't know if he's that big of a jerk. I, I think he's more of a pinhead on that team of Duke Cenobites from a oh, you know, like Hellraiser or something. To add context, is something I tweeted from the field. I retweeted a post from the field of 68 in which Terrence Oglesby, who I got to say, Terrence Oglesby shows a lot of Duke love on the field of 68, and I appreciate right. it. And he says, by, and the quote, one of the big quotes is that by February, Duke is going to be a nightmare. And he says, because Duke has built the perfect roster around Cooper Fleck. So in which I took that, and to be completely honest, Matt, I was quoting a Nicki Minaj verse from My Chick Bad, if you remember that song, where she no, says, nightmare on Elm Street, and guess who's playing Freddy? And so that's why I said, nightmare on Elm, and then which I reposted it with the caption, nightmare on Elm Street, I guess Coop is playing Freddy. Oh, okay. Now it makes sense. Now, it, you see, I know like maybe two Nicki Minaj songs, I think. I'm Okay, uh, I'm a Lil Wayne fan at my core. And like Lil Wayne is kind of who introduced Nicki Minaj and Drake to the world and, or really like helped jumpstart their careers in a lot of ways. So that's why it makes sense for me. Right. Yeah, I know like Jeff one. Baby is my goat. I know like one Nicki, maybe two Nicki Minaj songs. Bro, remember I was, that time we talked about the Carter album covers and how it, it freaked you out every time you went into the store? Yeah, well, I mean, it did freak me out because it was like this dead-eyed kid in a graduation gown staring at me with tattoos, you know? I was like, I was a good sheltered kid, you know? I didn't expect that when I walked into my good, wholesome Walmart. I, I'm kidding about all this, naturally. It did really freak me out, but it was just because I didn't know what, I, what it was. You know what also freaked me out was the 50 Cent album cover with like the broken glass and stuff because I thought... I picked it up once and I thought I broke the CD because I didn't realize that's what the album got. And I was like, oh my God, I'm going to have to pay for this. I don't even know who this is. And it's like, no, that's just what the album I, cover looks well, like. Well, luckily for you, you would only have to pay 50 cent. Hey, yo. Hey, yo. Lay mask hey, for the day. Six foot, seven foot, eight foot bunch. That, that's a Lil Wayne song. Thank you. I know. It's also a Banana Boat song. Harry Belafonte, Beetlejuice. Yes, I know. I know what you're referencing, okay. actually. Okay, okay, good. But good. no, no, but Lil, Wayne, but Lil Wayne made it much cooler, which I do want to state before we run out of time that I know the the popular line from that song is "Real G's moving silence like lasagna," but the cool. most creative line from that song is when he says, "I got through that sentence like a subject and a predicate." That's the most creative line from that song. I still like that line about mansions in Wisconsin from T Pain. That always makes me giggle a little. I love In that. In fact, Lil Wayne is on that song. T Pain actually has a wonderful voice once you hear him sing without like auto tune. Auto tune, one hundred percent. He should have never used auto tune in the first place. He should have never, because his voice is just um, borderline angelic. I absolutely was like floored when I heard him. Oh my gosh, it was amazing, especially when he started singing the intro to uh, "Buy You a Drink." That was amazing. Before we run out of time, I do have to get the closing in there before me and Matt rant for the rest of the the time. As always, like and subscribe to Less Is More Sports uh, YouTube and Spotify channel. Be sure to follow the social media pages on Facebook, Twitter, and Threads. That's at Less Is More Sports. And until next time, Matt and I are going to continue this rant. Mansion in yep. Wisconsin. Mansion in Wisconsin. So actually, Les, what we're going to talk about now is in the 1950s, Cold War trauma had caused many rural Americans to this, have thoughts about UFOs and things in the sky. So what happens next is he's going to cut me off, but I'm going to get it in. What happens next is a series of 